Dan Greider, Probable Cause. Welcome. It's Sunday night, August 18th, 2024. Glad to have you with us in another live chat. This is our regular Sunday evening production. Not really live. The live chat is live, but uh, I build these once a week as a summary. Good news this week, there's not really a lot to talk about, so I'll do a bunch of other fun housekeeping type stuff and bring you up to speed. First of all, I want to tell you about the music. Have you ever noticed how I start these things with the music and you can hear the music going now? How is it that I time it so that I can always do this? How do I time that? Well, that's the magic of editing, and I've gotten fairly good at editing and all that kind of stuff. It's actually a lot of fun. I enjoy video editing probably more than I do shooting or any of the rest of that kind of stuff. Video editing is fun. I use Vegas Pro and I can build up to 10 tracks simultaneously, probably more if I needed to. Anyway, we'll take just a minute, let you guys filter into the chat room, make sure you say hi and where you're checking in from. Mostly today, it's hot out there in America. Type in a two or three digit number, your high temperature where you live, what was your high temperature for today? That's always interesting to look at. Uh, we'll do that right now. Wow, look at those numbers rolling in. There's look at all the numbers up above 100. It is hot. It is hot in America. Be very careful out there. Stay hydrated and stay out of the sun the best you can. I have been trying to do a little bit better myself since the accident. I'm talking about the Lockheed Electra crash, and I've got an interview with Glenn at the end of this. I'll save it for the end because I got a little bit of storytelling stuff I'm going to do to the end. Some of you people who are just here for the accident data, I'll put that a little bit closer to the front so that you don't have to wade through all that to the very, very end. But I've got a couple interesting stories. I've got an interview with Glenn and all that stuff is coming up. Interestingly enough, I went out to talk to Glenn here this week and shoot a video. I took my watch out there to see if uh, he could stick a pin in this thing. His watch is busted as well. His watch busted in the accident. He has not worn a watch since the crash June 17th, just like me. So that day he ordered a couple of pins for our watches. So maybe we could both start wearing a watch again. Isn't that interesting? I'll talk a little bit more about the crash when I do that interview with Glenn. Got a couple little things. So, so you can see who Glenn is. He's the guy that was left seat in the Lockheed Electra. Thankful to be alive. And I'll tell you, this whole AQP thing means a lot more now that I've been in this serious of an airplane crash. I've been in a lot of airplane crashes, mishaps, and all that kind of stuff before. I've never been hurt that badly in a crash. And I can tell you, it's not fun. It's it's excruciating, and especially the thought of the fact that you're about to die. Really, when that thing hit and there was fuel everywhere and the engine wouldn't quit running, I knew for sure I only had a few seconds left to live. My only question was if I was going to burn up slowly or if there was going to be an explosion and it's just over instantly a horrible horrible few seconds to think about no i don't have ptsd it was scary i there's nothing i can do i was completely trapped in that airplane could not get out but we did and everything happened i think you all know the story on that so anyway the interview with glenn is coming up um, i want to say thanks to all you people who have supported one and two dollars i'll give you the information on how to do that it's completely uh, painless to do that via Zelle, PayPal, Cash App, and Venmo, and all that kind of stuff. I'll show you how to do that. A lot of you people have been sending in stuff via snail mail, and I really appreciate that. Here's a guy. I won't put his uh, uh, name on here, uh, his last name, but his name Stephen wrote me a very nice note here, a handwritten note. And I've been getting three or four of those per week in the form of a note or a card, and that is really interesting. This guy's I don't know, 70 something years old, retired guy, pilot, and uh, totally a lot of fun. I appreciate that. If you want to send me snail mail, I will always open snail mail unless it's anonymous. If you're wanting to send me anonymous mail, I throw that in the trash. So make sure you put a, a name and a return address on it so I know who you are and where it's coming from. And I appreciate that. I don't open any anonymous email or mail or anything like that. Appreciate it. I'm going to get a couple other housekeeping items taken care of here, real quick. The DC-3 is sold. Some of you already know that. I did sell it. I was in the process of uh, talking to several people earlier in 2024 who had made good offers on the DC-3. I wasn't quite ready to sell it in the spring and summer of 2024. I really thought I was going to uh, instruct in that airplane one more season, give people one more last chance to come in and fly at left seat. When the accident happened, I kind of changed my mind. The last existing offer that was still on the table I took that offer. This is going to a guy named Jim McFadden, who is a pilot and owns an auction company. He has bought the airplane with intents to flip it. 
I think that he will, and I think that it'll do good. I'll put the proxy bid location in there right now. The highest bid on this thing is only $14,000. This is uh, this is a good airplane with all the records, all the manuals. It comes with two jacks. It's going to go for a little bit more than $14,000, but it's not a lot. This is not a $5 million deal. I think four guys could kick in fifty grand a piece and fly this airplane away easily. You can register for proxy bid. You do have to put up a $1,000 deposit which uh, discourages some of the tire kickers who want to make bids and uh, and not ever have any intention of actually buying the airplane. So that's all on proxy bid. You can see the current bid right in here right now is very, very low. If you want to bid on it, I think the airplane will go for not very much. Um, it should go for several hundred thousand dollars. Um, I hope it does. And uh, that should be a, a really good benchmark. We'll see in the end. It's a fabulous airplane with new engines, new props. It's in annual, ready to fly. The whole thing is totally good. That's via proxy bid, and you can take a look at it now. I want to also mention the bidding for that DC-3 will close on September 3, which is uh, Labor Day weekend. Monday is... The holiday and then tuesday bidding will close sometime on tuesday jim mcfadden will be down here in atlanta with me we'll do a couple live things uh, to promote his auction and show that thing we'll do a couple live things to show how the uh, airplane operates and things like that should be a lot of fun if you'd like to come in and hang with us either monday night monday night labor day we're having a little bit of party out there at the airport a little social and get together if you'd like to come in and uh, be with us for the evening that's totally fine if you'd like to with hang with us for the day on tuesday during the bidding you can do that it's all free hampton airport khmp and that's on uh, september 3 i'm not exactly sure what time yet bidding will close on september 3 Whoever gets it, gets it. I would sure like to see the airplane go to a great home. Several people have asked why I'm selling the airplane. I I need to sell that airplane because it is, I've had it almost 25 years. I'm not getting any younger and I. it is time for that airplane to go to a new home. I would sure like to help and support the new owner in the transition and see it go to a great new home where I had visiting rights on occasion to go and see my old airplane again. It's been a fantastic family airplane. All things, all good things must close and come to an end. The days of me owning a DC-3 and operating and instructing in it are at the very, very end. And that's how that's going to happen. September 2 and 3, put it on your calendar. If you'd like logistics help in coming in to visit us, uh, send me an email and I'll certainly try to help you with that. You know, the whole purpose of my tiny little itty bitty fledgling YouTube channel is AQP saving lives and reduction in the general aviation fatal accident rate. We've done really good. I'll show you this graphic on the screen. This comes from Landon Cohen. I'll, I'll show you the graphic first and then take a guess who Landon really is. But uh, this is the graphic. We're at 11.61 general aviation fatal accidents per month prorated right down to the day for 2024. We're 26 ahead of where we were a year ago right now. That's 26 accidents less than what we had one year ago right now. 2024 is turning out to be a banner year for general aviation fatals. In terms of safety, we are far less. Are we flying less or flying more? I think we're flying more. We're going to get the numbers eventually that will prorate that per 100,000 hours flight hours flown. I think we're totally good. I'll show you this graphic right here I built. Yes, it's my cheesy on-screen graphics OSG, but I made this uh, after another accident that we talked about. This is what AQP is, and I'll tell you, AQP has nothing to do with FAA. AQP is being ready for what's about to happen to you in your airplane. Just like me in the Lockheed, something happened to me in the Lockheed. If I had known in advance what was about to happen to me, I would have handled that totally different. That accident got me because I was not ready. AQP is becoming alive. Uh, FAA is becoming alive. AQP is staying alive. This is FAA. This is Dan. This is initial training. This is recurrent training. This is ACS, your FAA ACS. This is AQP. This is normal operations. This is abnormal. This is no surprise. All your training to get your license is no surprise. AQP is all surprise. Boy, did I get surprised in the Lockheed crash. This is training. AQP is conditioning. I want to condition you 
to do the right response. This is evaluation. The FAA gives you an evaluation called a check ride. There's no evaluation in AQP. It's just conditioning you to do the right response. This is no awareness about what's to happen to you. This is full awareness of what is about to happen to you. Yes, when you get your pilot's license, it's a license for something bad to happen to you. Your response to it in the time of crisis, in that two and a half seconds where your brain goes to mush, your response is critical. If you don't handle it properly, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's AQP for general aviation. That is the whole purpose of this channel. Let's take a look. Uh, let me show you. Let me show you a picture of Landon. I told you Landon Cohen is my uh, volunteer da data analyst. He looks like a big, huge biker guy. This guy here he is right here with his wife and daughter. A huge thanks to Landon Cohen who's taken over all my data analytics and graphs and graph building. Landon has an IQ of about 650 or something like that uh, compared to me who uh, seventh grade was my senior year so I can't do any of that stuff. Uh, a tremendous amount of volunteers out there helping with the DTSB network right now helping and all that stuff. Landon is just one of them who works tirelessly on all this stuff on a volunteer basis. There's nobody getting paid. Nobody on a contract basis to build graphs and collect data and all that kind of stuff. That's how I do this every week. All right, let's go on and take a look at the uh, actual accident data for the month of August. I don't put the August data up on the screen here in just a second. Before I do that, I've had a lot of people ask about that same Brazil crash, the stall spin. I said it last week and I'll say it again. I don't know. I can't tell. And there's not very much information out there. All I can tell you is my best guess is could be icing but really the flight path to me does not look like icing i'll be the first to look at the information and the conclusion as soon as it comes out i i am no more further ahead of you my initial gut reaction says that this was not an icing accident i think this was something else the flight track and how it got there in the altitude excursions to me do not point to icing i just don't see that but who knows, I have definitely been wrong before. Here's an accident I want to tell you about. This is November 7, 531 Papa. This is a Comanche. Just happened up in uh, New York here the other day. This is a non-stabilized approach. Flew a non-stabilized approach. News says that it happened during uh, takeoff. This actually, actually happened during landing. Flew high and fast on a 4,000-foot strip. Went long and went off the end. Nobody got hurt, which is all very good. Here's the November, or the uh, October. August data on the screen here. I'll put it up here for you. So far, a total of six accidents in the month of August. We've already talked about the uh, first one. That's the gyro. I got no idea what Carol DeGraw, she was 83 years old, what she did. The F-33 in Oklahoma. Um, this was Michael Koswan, 68 years old. I formerly had the pilot's name wrong. Daniel Swinehart was a pastor with his two children. Mr. Koswan was the pilot. He was an FAA employee. I think this should be a stark reminder for before takeoff checklist. This, I am I can almost promise you, this was an elevator trim misset. This airplane rolled down the runway. If you've ever been in a Baron or a Bonanza loaded aft with a full aft elevator trim on takeoff when you push the power to it, this, what, this is what it does. And as soon as that nose comes up, the torque of the engine is trying to pull you left. If you keep on going and don't close the throttle, this thing is going to get in the air. It is going to be right in ground effect on the edge of a stall and that engine torque is going to pull you to the left that appears to me to be exactly what this did if not it doesn't matter anyway do your before takeoff checklist all those critical items in the Learjet we used to call them the killer items check and double check killer items make sure you're all totally good our respects to this entire family a horrible horrible loss in Oklahoma City that was uh, November 8095 uniform then the 172 in texas michael lewis age 67 no information on that so far the 182 in uh, montana that was don long age 46 he had two passengers with him he flew it into the terrain i still don't understand why he flew that path that low over the train going to his destination and then now uh, the only two since last sunday are 3093 hotel that's an air coupe in Indiana, Roger Milheim, age 77. Here's a picture of the airplane right here. No idea, no information so far on what the accident was at all. And then the very last one, you've all heard about it. This is the Piper Cub up in Tennessee. This one just happened on the 16th, November 21811. is a Piper J3. Um, Scott Bloomquist, age 60. 
I have this down as suicide. I am sorry to speculate and go out early on this thing, but I'll show you a picture of Scott's t-shirt and I'll show you a picture of the barn where this thing crashed. Scott had a lot of problems going on. He'd been in a previous accident and he was riddled with pain that he could not get out of. And then last year he got diagnosed with prostate cancer. He was on chemo for prostate cancer. And you can have your own opinion about this. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this was Scott's airplane on his property and his life and his method. He left this earth under his own, own terms is what I believe. And I have a lot of respect for that. He did no damage to any other person or property. He had everything else taken care of. I don't know the whole story on it, but it definitely was, looks like a very intentional direct hit into his own barn. He was killed instantly and all of a sudden he is pain free. I, I have to respect uh, the fact that he did that and didn't hurt anybody else. And when it came time for him to say, I've had enough, I can't take the pain any longer, that's what he did. Um, let's go on to uh, the rest of these on here uh, for the month of August um, or for the month of uh, uh, for the year. Here's that graphic on here. I'm going to show you this is 11.61 fatals per month total. We've had 88 for the total, and in 2024, our passenger deaths are 75. Take a look at the month of August. 20 is where we ended up last year. Right now, we're at 6. September, we were at 11, so September was a lighter month for, uh, in 2023. We actually have a chance of building this thing and actually coming out. We are way ahead of what we did last year, and last year was an outstanding year. And that concludes our accident portion. If you want to turn this thing off and, and go on, this is the juicy part. I'm going to get to it next here. But this is the part. This is my storytelling part. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story to give you some backstory and back information on what really happened. So put your seatbelts on. If you want to get some popcorn, now would be a great time. Make sure you say hi and check in in the chat room. I'm here with you. Make sure you jump in there and say hi. Here comes the rest. Here comes the rest of it. So this is a story you're probably sick of hearing about EAA and some of that kind of stuff, but it's interesting stuff. And I only tell you because I was there, I was directly involved and this is the backstory. I'm going to give you the whole thing before I do that. I forgot to tell you, so many people have asked about my forehead injury and that uh, oozy stuff that I'm putting on my forehead. I'm still continuing to do that. I believe it is having an effect. It's not a sales thing, a promotion thing. I'm not endorsing anything. I'm just telling you that uh, somebody sent me some stuff that I think uh, I think is making a big difference. Here's the uh, damage on my forehead here, and you can see kind of where it's at. I've been uh, lightly keeping that oiled uh, mostly at night and a little bit during the day, just keeping all that stuff on there. And it, uh, it feels so much better. Um, it has taken the swelling out of that. I don't know what it is yet. I'll, I'll have a future thing once I... Uh, Got a few other things taken care of here. I'll do a little analysis on there and tell you, but I'm not I'm not selling it. I'm not taking a cut or anything like that. I'm going to tell you what the stuff is. You can do what you want to. I'll tell you my opinion of it in the very very end whether it actually really did something or not. I think I think it has helped me in my particular case. Would it help you? I don't know. All right, here's the EAA story. I'm going to back up and tell you all the way back to 2010, I built this organization called The Last Time. It was my idea to bring all the DC-3s that were flyable to one location in northern Illinois for a fly-in. I called it The Last Time. It was thelasttime.org. I had about 35 DC-3s registered to show up for a weekend where you get cheap gas, free fuel, or not free fuel, discounted fuel, and a complete weekend where you're taken care of, bring all the DC-3s together. And then on Monday morning, we launched those DC-3s in formation and fly them into AirVenture. That was my idea. So I did that. I knew all the guys. I knew every one of those guys, and we put that whole thing together. We ended up with about 35 DC-3s on the registry, knowing that there's going to be some last-minute people who either drop out or don't make it or something like that. The ramp and airport could handle reasonably 25 DC-3s. Target-wise, that's where we ended up at. The organization built and got bigger and bigger. It got a lot of press. The excitement of flying 25 or 30 DC-3s into AirVenture in formation was very exciting. And it was the last time. That was the last time anybody's ever had that many DC-3s in flight together, for sure. Well, EAA, in their infinite wisdom, they got a hold of the idea. 
EAA contacted me and they wanted to own and control the entire operation, which was 100 miles south of AirVenture the weekend prior. It was their idea to set up tickets and armbands and sell tickets and produce revenue for people coming through the gate to see the weekend prior to see my event called The Last Time. The dinner and the everything for all of my people, my crews, all my DC3 people, all that stuff was free. We did not charge an admission fee for any family, any individual that wanted to go out to the airport and walk around among the DC3s. It was our idea to make it completely free. And it was. We paid for all of our own stuff. We're completely independent. Once EAA saw how big it was and how many DC3s I had gathered up, they wanted to own it. They sent me emails and called and sent people to knock on my door to tell me that they wanted to own this. I'm going to read this off the internet for you here. This says DC-3 reunion hits turbulence, the structure of a much anticipated mass arrival of DC-3 aircraft at this year's Air Venture Oshkosh is in question after an apparent rift developed between the owners group organizing the 40 ship formation and EAA. Well, that's me. I'm the guy that organized it. I put the entire thing together. And when they called and said that they wanted to own it, I said, no, we don't need you. We'll fly them in in formation. You arrange parking and logistics once they land, they're on their own. But I'm going to I'm gonna do this thing and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to take care of my guys. And that's the way we're going to do it. They threatened to say, we will not give you a landing clearance at AirVention. To which I replied, that's fine. Now, the interesting thing here is that EAA was started by, EAA, by the way, is Experimental Aircraft Association. It was started by a guy named Paul Pobrezny, a wartime C-47 vet who was a personal friend of mine. I had met and known Paul many, many times, and, and he'd been on my airplane. I'd visited with him. We had each other's cell numbers, and we had stayed in communication. When this came time to happen, Paul contacted me, and he wanted to know if he could fly left seat in my airplane into AirVenture. Paul was long since retired from EAA, and I said, of course, I'd be honored to have you sit left seat. Well, when EAA and, and Paul Pobresny's son, Tom, found out about that, there was a huge rift between Paul and Tom, and Paul sent me text messages and said that his son, Tom, is no longer speaking to him over this, over the fact that he would go down there to ride a DC-3 into AirVenture, not controlled by EAA. It totally hurt Paul's feelings, and in the very, very end, Paul elected not to go just because literally his son, Tom, was no longer speaking to him over this. That's how EAA handled those kind of things. They definitely wanted to strong arm and own it. I said, that's fine. You guys do whatever you want to do. We'll do our organization. We'll do our weekend thing. And if we don't end up flying into AirVenture, that's fine too. If you don't want them, just say so and we'll go someplace else. That's total. That's totally fine. In the very end, I put B. Haydu in the left-hand seat. Uh, she was a wasp, and I've got pictures of B. Haydu leading that formation. We were the we were the lead airplane in my DC-3 going into AirVenture. It all worked totally good. I'm going to show you a little bit of video of some of the airplanes. We ended up with about 24 airplanes landing single file. We flew formation into AirVenture. They, at the last minute, that's EAA, at the very last minute, they said, yes, uh, you, can, you can bring them in. And we brought them in. We came in from the west. We descended over the top of EAA at about 4,000 feet. We went out over the lake and broke into trail formation, single file, and we landed those DC-3s on 1-8 right, the big runway, one at a time. It took like 25 minutes to get all the airplanes down and recovered. It was huge. It all worked perfect. 25 airplanes, 24 airplanes in formation. None of us had ever flown in formation with each other. We were a very loose three-ship and four-ship uh, formation in flight and route, but we all, we all did our jobs. I did a complete briefing. Everybody knew what their job was, and the whole thing worked completely perfectly all the way around. So that was 2010. EAA was not happy with me. That's where the problem started. I didn't bow to EAA power. I said, no, we're going to do our deal here. If you don't want it, you just say so, and we'll do something different. Now let's fast forward to 2017, which was the next time that I flew my DC-3 into AirVenture. I took it up there, and on the way in, this is a very interesting story. I had a whole bunch of people on the DC-3, but I had Preston in the left seat, and I was in the right seat. And I had a guy on the jump seat who was a single-engine pilot, but he owned a Cirrus. Very tech. All the Cirrus guys are very tech. He had iPads. He had electronics. He was autopilot. He was totally amazed with the DC-3 and our lack of tech. But on the way up to AirVenture, this guy asked several times as we got closer to AirVenture in the DC-3. He was on the jump seat and communicating with us. He said, what, uh, what are we going to do? What kind of an arrival are we going to do into AirVenture? 
and the thought occurred to me that he was already thinking ahead about doing the Fisk arrival, which is not going to work, or the Warbird arrival, which was not one of my favorites either. So the thought hit me at the time, I might be able to have a little bit of fun with this guy. We'll see how it works out. Unbeknownst to him, I had the tower frequency up, 26.6. I was already listening to tower frequency a long ways out. I had the ATIS, and I was listening, and our evening arrival into AirVenture, and it wasn't that busy. So on the way in, the guy asked again, Dan, do you have the, uh, the arrival notum? Of course I had it, the notum. I had it printed. I had it on a clipboard. I had it with me. Doesn't really matter for what we're going to do. We could slide out to the east to do the Warbird arrival if we need to. But coming up on Fond du Lac is a decision point. Do you want to go to the right and do the Warbird arrival? Or do you want to go to the left and, and do the Fisk? So he got nervous. He said, Dan, we're coming up on Fond du Lac. What are you going to do? Which, which way are you going to go? And I said, just to kind of egg things on a little bit, I said, you know, I'm really not feeling it. And the guy about came out of a seat. He said, what do you mean you're not feeling it? I said, you know, I think that whole EAA NOTAM thing is totally overrated. I really, I'm just, I'm just not feeling it. And he said, what do you mean not feeling it? You have to do, you have to, uh, unbeknownst to him, I was still listening on tower frequency. We passed Fond du Lac. And remember EAA Oshkosh is just a class D with a five mile range around it. I listened on this thing, reaching Fond du Lac, Preston said, Dan, what do you want? And I said, fly north and give me a little more power and a little more nose down of which preston did and the guy in the jump seat was like you can't go north with more power and more nose down said, yes we can let's go a little lower let's come out of 1500 feet let's start a, a nice easy descent and get some speed going and that's exactly what preston did as we got closer still now at nine miles outside of of uh, the class d the uh the guy in the jump seat still wanted to know what, what are we going to do and how is this going to work and I was still listening to the tower at, at six miles, just outside the class D. It got a little quiet on the frequency. And I said, uh, uh, Oshkosh uh, tower DC three, seven miles south inbound, like straight in on three, six left to which the controller, a female controller said three, six left clear to land. And Preston said, Dan, what do you want? I said, I want a little more power, a little more nose down. And the guy in the jump seat said, I don't understand how all this is working. And I said, it's okay. They just gave us three, six left. We're just going straight in. There's not that much going on out here. It's evening time. The air show's over and most people are leaving. So on the way in, now we're on a four mile final, but we're going really fast. Obviously, we're not going to land out of this. And the guy in the jump seat was completely nervous. I knew I was going to convert a low pass out of this, but he didn't. At the very last second, Preston said one more time, Dan, what do you want? I said, well, I think I'll take a little more power and a little more nose down, of which the guy in the jump seat was about to come out of his skin. At that point, I squeezed the mic and I asked the tower, the same lady on the tower said, any chance for a low pass on 3-6 left? And the lady came back immediately. Low pass 3-6 left approved. Make your pull up to the, uh, to the east before the tower and enter the downwind for 3-6 left. And the guy could not understand how all this was happening. And Preston said, what do you want? I said, I'll take a little more power, a little more nose down. Yes. Now we're down at 500 feet on a two mile final and the whole airplane is starting to shake because we're going really pretty fast. And now VNE is starting to become an issue here. And we're on the way down at the very last second at about 300 AGL. I said, Preston, I'll take the airplane, my controls. And he said, your controls. He handed me the controls, and on the way down here, I pushed the nose even lower, lower, and we took it right up to the most speed that we could get out of that old Douglas racer. Came right down the runway at about 100 feet, and it looked beautiful. When I got to the appropriate point, I did a nice, easy up and to the right, into this arcing right-hand turn onto the downwind. And on the radio, the same lady said, that was beautiful. To which I replied, can I have another one? And she said, yes, of course. It, and I said, okay, I appreciate that. She goes, enter right downwind for three, six left. You're cleared second low approach. And the guy in the jump seat is like, this isn't like anything I've ever even heard of. I said, it's okay. We're talking to the tower. It's not a big deal. We did a second low pass, the exact same thing. I'm still flying the airplane. Took it all the way down the runway at about 100 feet. It was beautiful. I got a second compliment from the lady in the tower. She said that was spectacular. And I said, I'd like clear to land, please. She said, right downwind for runway 36 left. You are clear to land. We swung it out. I threw the gear and flaps out there before landing checklist. Everything's good. 
I asked about the dot or where they wanted me to land. She said, the entire runway is yours. Plan on clearing at the far end, last left-hand turn, whatever, the Papa, Papa 2 or something like that at the very end. I said, okay, now I'm flying the airplane. I got it configured right on VREF, and my left main touched first brick. I went the full length of 3.6 left on my left tire. Why? Because it's fun. I went the full length of 3.6 left on my left wheel before I got down there to the very end with a couple thousand feet left. Then I put the right main down, then I lowered the tail wheel. I slowed to taxi speed, cleared the runway, and as soon as we cleared the runway, there was the marshallers. We cleared the runway to the left, which is facing west. The marshallers started pointing us down there to the, uh, uh, to the south, and we taxied in. Now, there's two guys that were there that night in 2017 that were completely upset about my arrival. These very, these very two guys are the same guys that would come back to haunt me in the year 2021. And I'm going to let you listen to Glenn's interview next here. These are the same two guys that he's talking about here. That's where these two guys most got upset is over my arrival in 2017. Let's listen to Glenn's interview next. All right, down here in the hangar with Glenn Hancock, just uh, visiting a little bit about the Lockheed crash. You know, it's been 60 days since you crashed that thing. I was kind of along for the ride there, but uh, a lot of people asked uh, about your condition. Tell me, tell me how how are you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm probably 80 percent. I, I I swim every morning and work out, so I'm I'm getting stronger, but I. Uh, pretty much lost most of my muscle and have kind of started back over. But yeah, it took it took a lump. And uh, what about your chest and chest damage? What? Uh... It's, I mean, it's fine. I, swimming is helping me a lot because it's, I mean, it still hurts in the middle of my chest. Yeah. But it's, I mean, my ribs are, if you gave me a big hug, it probably hurt, but my ribs are good enough that I, I can do most everything. Yeah, I'm not gonna give you a big but, hug. That's good. Closest, closest I came, I had no idea when all that stuff happened, but um, trying to help you get out of there, I probably did damage to your ribs and, and you lungs. You probably caused most of it. I probably but. caused most of it, but I was just trying to get you out of the airplane. But all that stuff is, I mean, it was it was 60 days ago. I'm just glad that uh, you're good. Jason is mostly good, I guess. Yeah, Jason, so he had to get surgery again because his leg got infected. And, uh, but the last I was talking, I saw him two days ago and it, it's doing better. He's starting yes. to walk like normal instead of hunched over. So it's, he's and, getting better. And then, uh, what about the status of the airplane? Is the airplane fixable? So at this point, I believe it is. It's going to be a lot of work. It's probably going to take many years to get it going again, but I think I'm going to try. I've got a lead on the uh, fuselage that I'm going to try to, it's not a complete fuselage, so I've got to go look at it and see exactly what it's, you know, what its condition is. But the spar itself, the, the fire guys, when they were in there, cut one of the pieces of the spar, not the main part of the spar, but the web that goes on the inside of it. But I've got another spar over in the other hangar that I think I can get the pieces out of to fix that little thing. Um, and then my son and I've measured wing tips back to the the horizontal, and both wing tips are exactly the same. So, you know, there's still a chance that it's bent, but I feel a little bit better that that we'll be able to fix it. But it's going to be a lot of work because we've oh. got to get all the tubes and all the. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a massive project. Oh, uh, just replacing the whole center nose section in the cockpit. That cockpit is curled up like a tin can. I mean, there's nothing. There's yeah, nothing it's going to be a, it's going to be fun. Uh, but. but anyway, well, we, uh, we survived. The main thing I want to talk to you about is you were there. You and I have done a lot of flying, a lot of traveling, a lot of stuff in a lot of different places. But I was at Oshkosh in 2017 with the DC-3, and that literally was the last time I was there until 2021. So to set the stage, in 2017, I gave a ride to Flight Chops at Air Venture. They had the marshlers out there, and I asked for an intersection takeoff. That's where the Piper Cub was behind me, and our prop blast scooted him off the runway. Nobody got hurt, but there was two guys there that were really upset about that accident, 
incident, whatever you want to call it, from 2017. Those are the same two guys that you encountered. Tell us about what happened in 2021. We were both at a different air show and we decided to run up to Air Venture for a couple days to camp. I believe it was your idea to go up there. I'm not, I can't remember, but I don't I think... I mean, you always like follow me around like a puppy dog <laughs> to try to do everything I do, but... But you did the arrangement. You want to admit that on TV? I mean, on the, on the YouTube? I follow, I follow you around every now and then. You, you did the arranging. Tell me who you called. What arrangements did, did you well, do? Well, I didn't do... So all I... Okay, so you were still at the ACA or right. whatever you call that thing. And so we left and we went up there. And the idea was is we were going to get a parking spot where you could park over there in the same area. Right. And so we did. We went up. We parked. I think we were at the time we were parked beside maybe another Lockheed that was there. Um, but the or I don't even remember what we parked for beside. But at the time that we landed, I went over and talked to the two air marshals that were there that were parking me and told them that a DC, I didn't even tell them who it was. I said, a DC three is coming in and we wanted to get him parked over here beside us. Is that, is that possible? Their immediate response was, is who's DC three? And I said, Dan, and they said, Dan Greider. And I said, yes. And they said, well, he's not welcome back to the show. And I said, well, okay, but you guys are actually not the boss of the show. So could you call, and talk to somebody and find out because if he's not welcome here then I will tell him and he'll go home instead of coming here they said yes we'll go talk to somebody and at the time they started a conversation with me telling me that they were actually the two guys that were involved in the altercation with the Cub and that and that was why you weren't welcome to come back up there because you didn't you couldn't follow directions and and I you know I don't want to go down that road because you're not very good at following directions but the, but that was the story that they were giving me. So we left, or they left, and the so a couple hours went by, and then I went back over and talked to him again. And said, "Hey, have you have you found out whether or not he's able to come in here because he's going to be heading this way?" And they said, "No, we haven't we haven't talked to anybody yet." And so I went away again. The next thing I know, you're landing, right? And. I see them up on the taxiway stopping the airplane because there were a bunch of T6s parked beside the taxiway. Right. And so I, at that point, I told Elizabeth, I'm going to walk up there and see what's going on because this looks kind of crazy. And so I walked up, those same two guys were standing there and they were all upset because you had come into the airport. And so I confronted them and told them, look, I came over to you four hours ago and told you that Dan was coming up here in the DC-3 and you guys have not come back to tell me whether or not he's able to come in here or not. Right. And you told me that, that you didn't think he was, but you're not the boss of the air show, so who right. is it that we need to talk to? And they said, well, it doesn't matter now because he did. He just blasted through the, the, the guys up on the line and didn't do what they told him to do, and, and we're not letting him go any farther. And so I said, well, why can't we just push the T6s back five feet, let him through here, and park? And then you can have a discussion instead of shutting the whole taxiway down. And they were like, no, we're not doing that. And so I walked off at that point and then I just watched what they were doing. And, you know, I decided at that point that I wasn't going to go back to, to the air, to the show up there because of the way that they were treating you, because it was ridiculous. Like if, if they didn't want you to come in there, that's fine. I mean, I don't like for you to come over to my house a lot too, but that, you know, that that's one thing, but when you don't come back and actually say, no, he can't come, right. then it's all on them. It's not, it's not your fault. And so, and from what I understand, you have video of the lineman telling you to turn left when you came off the runway or off that taxiway yes. to come down to us. Yes. And so nobody had, had you didn't disobey any, any uh, instructions. So the whole thing was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. But, well, it, it all stems back to the 2017 deal where they were upset because I intentionally blew this cub off the runway. They had their line patrol boys out there. They had plenty of people. They should have stopped the cub. So, but nothing was ever said after that. After 2017, nobody ever said anything about that entire incident. When I came in there in 2021 to go camping with you, I landed 3-6. Tower told me to turn left at the end, so I did. 
When I turned left, there was the flagman telling me to turn left again and go south on the parallel taxiway. So that's what I did. I taxied south all the way to the point where I couldn't go any farther. And those T6s had their noses all the way up on the taxi. And that's where we stopped and shut down. There's nothing else I can do. I can't go backwards. How courteous were these same two guys? Well, they were assholes, I mean, to put it bluntly. Yeah. Like it, it, it was all I could do not to cuss them out because it, uh, they were complete and utter imbeciles. Yeah. Like they, they were just trying to start trouble at that point. They, they, there was nothing about doing anything that was right. It was just they didn't like you and they didn't want you there. Yeah. And you know, the main thing I remember from that is that one guy, one, he pointed to his hat and his badge and he told me that he owned the airspace because when I came in, I got a tower approved low pass and I brought it around. He told me that he owned the airspace. And I said, well, I don't think that's actually true. He goes, you don't know who I am, but I own this airspace and your low pass was not approved. And I said, well, we can talk about that later. What can we do about the airplane? But they were, they were so belligerent at that point that I, I knew there wasn't anything. But it's the same two guys from 2017. Nothing happened in 2017. I didn't know that there was a problem to come back up there in 2021, other than the fact that obviously uh, they don't like me. Yeah, and I and I don't know anything farther than that, other than probably most people don't like it. <laughs> well, that's not, that's on them. I'm actually pretty good. I'm pretty good with the banjo, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm in your own head. But. I'm actually okay. Well, I am glad that uh, we're both alive, and uh, I'm I'm totally 99% recovered. I'm going to start walking again in about 30 days. But is that is that really like a fair thing to say? 99% recovered. That I mean, you were really pretty low down there to begin with so you well, didn't really a, have that far that's a mental, to get back up to that place. that's a mental thing i've been brain damaged since early childhood so i don't think you'll find very many people that argue with that <laughs> i think i think i'm gonna be fine the uh i'm actually going to the gym a little bit i've got a new workout trainer uh -oh. that's working with me so this is scary and i don't have to ask what sex it is so, <laughs> so oh that's good all right well i appreciate you uh taking video to uh let everybody know kind of what, what the deal was. But honestly, the, the, the air venture thing, I've only been there in the DC-3 twice uh, in recent years, 2017 and 2021. Uh, I had no indication in 2021 that there was any kind of a previous limitation or, or anything or else I wouldn't have gone up there. And we, we tried, we asked. And well, I heard, I heard a story that you were up there this year and they were chasing you around. They did chase, they did chase me around. Yeah. Not to cause any problems. Damn well, writer. yeah, always innocent. Always, always innocent. And always in the middle of everything. Kind of. So. I was, I was in the middle of Atwaki, that's for sure, for an hour and forty minutes. Well, I hate that that happened, but yeah, well, not much we can. Not much we can do. All right, well, I'm going to get back to our, our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, talking with Glenn Hancock, a former owner of a beautiful Lockheed Electric that's now a bunch of... I still own it. You still own it, but it's no longer beautiful. It's, boy, it is a... It's still beautiful. You just have to ignore its face. Oh, man, that thing is it's a It's a two-bagger. It's, it's amazing how far that cockpit and nose got crammed. I, I mean, it's, it literally split it like a tin can. It's like, it's crazy. I was sitting here looking. I got a, our next job in a couple of weeks when I get a little bit more strength to my hands we're going to take all the rivets out of that nose and take them off yeah and at least I won't have to look at it like that because it's, yeah. it's pretty horrendous yeah uh, there's nothing nothing left to that nose all right I'm gonna get back to uh video here's the rest of it so that was Glenn to make matters worse in 2017 they wanted me to give a ride to flight shops of which I did we taxied out to give a ride I put flight shops in the left seat we went out there and flight shops asked me several times i'm going to read it from my notes here flight chops asked me uh he said they've got a zillion marshallers out here yes and i asked him clear that's a question mark and he responded clear let's listen to that part of the tape i asked him are you clear i'm going to take an intersection takeoff are we clear and he looked out his window and he said clear this is oshkosh it's super busy but we had to do a run-up so situational awareness is obviously the pilot and command's responsibility, but we also got a zillion marshals around and we're kind of also trusting the other pilots to keep track of their own airplanes. All right, hold the yoke all the way back like this yep. and just put your checklist down for a second. We're just gonna do a run up real quick here. Make sure everything is uh, looking good here. Y'all clear on your side? Clear. 
apparently there was a Piper Cub behind me that was uh, taxing up behind me. The marshals did not stop the Piper Cub from taxing behind the DC-3 when there were still 20 people in line. They should not have let him go behind the DC-3. That is the job of the marshals. We ended up blowing the Cub off the runway, but we didn't even know he was back there. Flight Chops didn't know he was back there. I didn't know he was back there. I never even saw the Cub and couldn't see him from my perspective. We stopped the runway and we held short of 3-6 left until we got all that stuff squared away. The same two guys that Glenn's talking about, those were the guys that were completely upset over this Piper Cub incident. I didn't do it. I asked for an intersection takeoff. It was approved and the Piper Cub deal did his deal. Same two guys backwards how courteous were these same two guys well they were assholes I mean, to put it bluntly yeah like it, it, it was all i could do not to cuss them out because it, uh, they were complete and utter imbeciles yeah like they they were just trying to start trouble at that point they, they there was nothing about doing anything that was right it was just they didn't like you and they didn't want you there yeah and you know the main thing i remember from that is that one guy one, he pointed to his hat and his badge and he told me that he owned the airspace because when I came in I got a tower approved low pass and I brought it around he told me that he owned the airspace and I said well I don't think that's actually true he goes you don't know who I am but I own this airspace and your low pass was not approved so on tape flight chops says this and I'll play the uh, tape for you here he says kind of their job also to keep people clear from behind big airplanes question mark yes that is their job that's why they got all those marshals let's listen to that one more time kind of their job also to keep people clear from behind big airplanes yeah yeah welcome to Oscar. so that was 2017 the same two guys not very happy with dan over that uh, the same two guys that I had talked to in 2017, one of them pointed to his hat and he told me that he owned the airspace at AirVenture. He owned the ground. He was the big boss and he owned the airspace and that my low pass and one wheel landing were completely unacceptable. That's why he was upset in 2017 for sure. Now, let's fast forward to 2021. In 2021, it was Glenn's idea for us to take the Lockheed and the DC-3 go up and spend a couple days at AirVenture, camp out and have a little bit of fun. Glenn did all the legwork and calling and all that kind of stuff in advance. Actually, before he even took off, he had made some phone calls and reserved two spots and paid parking fees for a couple airplanes for a couple days. All that, unbeknownst to me, all he told me was that I'll take care of the logistics. Uh, you just bring the airplane up. We had talked on the phone. Glenn had given those guys plenty of time to say no, can't do it, and they never did. I think those same two guys were egging for me to bring the DC-3 back in there so they could start one more altercation. It's the same two EAA guys again. After I landed up there, this is in 2021, I brought the airplane in. I did the same thing. I did a low pass and a one wheel landing. Boy, did it make them mad. They didn't want to see a low pass and they didn't want me to land on one wheel at AirVenture, which is kind of the way I do it. Same two guys. Now, when I turn left at the end, same way I did in 2017 when I turned left at the end, the marshals pointed me south on the parallel taxiway. I went as far as I could till I got the T6s. That's when these same two guys came out, and boy, Glenn got into it with them. I could tell Glenn had already worked out. This is going to be fine. You got your T6s in the way, and Dan can't get past. That's your problem. It wasn't until they towed my airplane to the far north side of the airplane opposite of where Glenn was parked. It wasn't until they towed it all the way up there that the beer came out. And once the beer came out, I addressed that on the spot and said, I think you guys ought to hold off drinking beer while you're operating the tug and moving my airplane. That's when I went in. That's the problem. After, after this happened, EAA decided that that's enough of Dan and they want to give me this letter that to tell me that there's no trespassing on EAA property. Well, really, in order to do a no trespassing letter, there has to be a crime. Uh, there has to be a gun or drugs or cocaine or a fight or something like that. Nothing happened. I did everything like I was supposed to do. It was them that had a vendetta. Those same two guys had this vendetta against Dan. And now this letter comes out the next morning, only after I brought it up that they should not be drinking and tugging my airplane. That's when the letter came out. There is, there is no basis. Dan did not do anything wrong in any way on anyone. No matter what you think, it looked like I intentionally blew a cub off the runway. Not true. Absolutely not true. 
I got this letter for no trespassing, no trespassing on uh, EAA property, one of about 500 that they've handed out for people that they don't like, but they don't remember that this is actually airport public property. They can hand those letters out on public property that they have leased, but they have to have a very good valid reason. There has to be a crime and a sheriff's report for some kind of a something worth banning somebody from being on public Part 16 FAA property, there's got to be a really good reason for this. In this case, they simply don't have it, and there was no there was no anything. And that's all that happened in 2021. The continuing saga of EAA, I, I'm going to continue to talk about the EAA Oshkosh arrival, the FAA air traffic control aspect. These guys want to control your airplane. They want to tell you to rock your wings aggressively. Slowing about a half mile south of this, give me an aggressive rock. Well, what do you mean, give me an aggressive rock? Slowing about a half mile south of this, give me an aggressive rock. Why? You can't tell us to operate our airplanes like that, so I'm building a further tape to further exemplify how ridiculous it is to attempt to fly your airplane into AirVenture. I recommend going to AirVenture. I, I, I enjoy the air show. I enjoy the camaraderie, I enjoy the people, I enjoy the corn dogs. I certainly enjoy all the social aspects and camping and things like that. I don't recommend flying in there because you will become seriously killed trying to fly into AirVenture. You will definitely be dead attempting to do that. It's not safe, the whole thing is not standard. Um, the fun fly zone, I'm not a fan of that entire thing, uh, what they created up there in the EAA fun fly zone. So that's the whole story. Sorry for dragging this out and giving you more EAA information that you want, but I've actually only been to AirVenture in the DC-3 a few times, and one of them was in 2017, and one of them was in 2021. I'm gonna get out of here and get this video up and on the air, but I want you to know that I am progressing well. I still got three more weeks before my next appointment to get an x-ray and look at my leg to find out if it's possible to start walking on it. I'm on crutches and wheelchair even yet today. I can't walk on the leg, but that's because of doctor's orders. The leg actually feels really good. I'm on zero pain, zero drugs, zero anything. And Dylan has got me going to the gym and working out. So I am doing upper body and working out. All that stuff is going good. Dylan is a gym guy himself and I have been going to the gym I've changed my diet. I've cut out some of the stupid stuff like I did a year ago when I was on my health kick a year ago. I kind of fell off the wagon. I'm back on it. I'm drinking more water. I'm down. I'm down on weight just a little bit, and I'd like to continue that trend. If you've got any ideas on diet yourself, what to eat, what not to eat, what works for you, I'm mostly going meat and protein. I'm cutting out the bread and sugars and cutting out the stupid stuff, which worked really well for me last time and I, I already feel much much better I have absolutely killed my upper body here in the last couple of weeks doing this stuff but I needed to get out of the house get to the gym I can do all that kind of stuff I'm on crutches I can be at the gym and it's working out totally good I'd like to ask for your support if you have a chance to uh, support me on this thing either via the DTSB super fund here's the address if you want to mail a paycheck this is uh, if you want to mail a check to DTSB it's a 501c3 your donations are completely tax deductible if you want a donation to go to Dan for all his efforts and everything I'm trying to figure out and I'm trying to help all that kind of stuff one and two dollars is totally appropriate if I could get 50 people to give me one dollar I would be 50 bucks ahead that would be totally cool Zell PayPal Cash App, Venmo. I'm going to get out of here and get this video up and on the air. Sorry for the storytelling here, but it's a fascinating story, and I'm going to continue to tell the story and continue this thing going on. Thanks for hanging in here this evening, and I'm going to get uh, get this thing going here. For my tiny little itty-bitty fledgling YouTube channel, Dang Ryder, Problem Cause. They started a conversation with me telling me that they were actually the two guys that were involved in the altercation with the Cubs.